So before starting on section 3.1 study guide, I want to go over a few things to give you an idea of what I would like you to learn from this section. Let's talk about the structure of a gene. A gene has a promoter, then there's a coding region. Now the promoter is where RNA polymerase will bind to to make the messenger RNA, or at least the pre-messenger RNA, which then gets processed to become the messenger RNA when the introns are removed and the axons are spliced together. Now within a cell, there's roughly 20,000 or more genes, at least a human cell. And every cell in the human genome will have equivalent number of genes. All those genes are available to every cell. Now we know that during the process of differentiation, some of these genes are permanently silenced. So we have all these genes, and let's just draw a few genes here. We'll make them different sizes, so to denote their difference, but they all have a promoter. Some of them are larger, some are tinier. And etc. Right, and imagine 20,000 plus of these. Now, some that are permanently silenced, well, they will never bind RNA polymerase and make messenger RNA. So let's imagine that, for example, this one right here is permanently silenced in a certain cell. In another cell, it could be available. Now, among all these genes that are available, now we have this pool of genes that are not silenced, right? Now, among the ones that are not silenced, meaning that the RNA polymerase can bind to the promoter and make messenger RNA, right? Now, within those, you have what we call housekeeping genes. These are genes that all cells express. For example, the genes that eventually lead to a product, which is a protein that is an enzyme, and cellular respiration. All cells use cellular respiration. Therefore, all cells will express those enzymes. Also, you can think of certain transporters, for example, the sodium-potassium pump, channels like the potassium leak channel. So all of those would be housekeeping genes because all cells express those genes. Now, the other subset would be tissue-specific genes. Now, these are the genes that make one cell type different than another. For example, a neuron from a liver cell. And give it a different morphology, different phenotype, and etc. Now, what makes it so that these things are even expressed, right? And that has to do with a subset of proteins that bind to the promoter or near the promoter and recruit RNA polymerase to the promoter. Because within these tissue-specific genes, even housekeeping genes, some of these don't have to be expressed all the time. For example, and this is basically the topic of this section, and you have already seen this type of tr single transduction pathway, you have some sort of stimulus or signal coming into the cell, either an external or an internal signal, that leads to some things happening within the cell that leads to a response. Now that response could be transcription translation or gene expression. That means the genes that get expressed are not always being expressed. They're being maybe expressed at low levels or not being expressed at all. The signal comes into the cell, whether it's an external and internal signal, and that leads to the ramping up of the expression of these genes. So what we're interested in is what are the players that are involved in actually bringing RNA polymerase to the promoter? Because RNA polymerase actually binds very weakly to most promoters. So it needs help. And these proteins that are involved in recruiting RNA polymerase to the promoter are of interest to us. They're called 
transcription regulatory proteins. And transcription regulatory proteins are also called transcription factors. So these are equivalent terms, the equal sign being put between them. And these can be abbreviated as TRPs or transcription factors as TF. Okay. What these guys will do is they'll bind to enhancer regions within the gene. So let's go back and look at our gene on top right there. So within the gene, there will be regulatory sequences typically called enhancer regions or cis regulatory elements, which are also called enhancer regions in some other textbooks. This is going to be a nucleotide sequence that could be somewhere, for example, somewhere downstream of the promoter, like right here perhaps. It could be within the gene itself. It could be upstream of the promoter, somewhere around here. The most important thing is that these regions, these cis regulatory elements, are part of the gene. Without them, the gene would not work. The gene is just not the coding region. It's the promoter, the regulatory sequences, and the coding region. So transcription factors, which are proteins, or transcription regulatory proteins, will bind to these regions and they will recruit RNA polymerase to the promoter and that will lead to transcription, the messenger RNA being made. And that's the first step, right? Once the messenger RNA is made, then you go to translation where the protein is being transcribed if the RNA product of the gene is a messenger RNA coding for a protein. Some RNA products of a gene, the RNA is the active molecule that has some sort of biological property. All right, so when we're going through this section, we're just worried about this part. It's a rather short section, so we will quickly go through it. Okay, so control of gene expression. In multicellular organisms, all somatic cells are genotypically equivalent, yet different cell types in a multicellular organism can be vastly different from each other in function and form. So here we have a picture of a neuron, our nice neuron that we've been talking about for the last three weeks. And you can see a liver cell right over here. And we can agree that these two cells are very different, although they're genotypically the same. Phenotypically, extremely different. All cells in multicellular organisms are descendant of a single cell. In the case of sexual reproduction in animals, the initial cell is the fertilized egg or the zygote. Each somatic cell in a multicellular organism carries the necessary genetic information to form a full organism. And this is what's being shown here, is that depending on the animal, what you can basically do is if you take an adult cell, remove the genetic material, um, inject it into a fertilized egg while removing the genetic material in the fertilized egg and replacing it with the adult cell's chromosomes, you can eventually get an adult. Um, and this is just the cases being shown here. The one for the cow that is being shown here. Epithelial cells from the ovary ducts or oviducts uh, are removed. Uh, and then you have unfertilized egg. So in this case, the unfertilized egg is fused with the epithelial cells from the oviduct. And this is just through some manipulation. And you get a reconstructed zygote and you get cell division. You get the embryo and you get the calf. The embryo is put into a foster mother. Meaning that in a somatic cell, which has the full set of chromosomes, that the genetic information is there to build a full organism. The zygote and the early products of the first few rounds of cell division are pluripotent. These embryonic stem cells can become any cell type. And that's basically the definition of pluripotent. Pluripotent means a cell that basically all the genes have not been silenced yet. So depending on the environment during development, they can become different types of cells when different genes are silenced and the phenotype starts to become specialized. This process of specialization is called differentiation and under normal condition is irreversible. The process of differentiation is initiated by cell due to the external signals received by the cell. This leads to permanent silencing of some genes and the fine tuning of the expression level of other genes.
This process leads to different cell types having different genetic expression profiles or differential gene expression between cells. Some genes are only expressed in certain tissue and therefore called tissue-specific genes, while others are expressed in all cell types and are called housekeeping genes. The products of housekeeping genes are necessary for all cells to maintain life, for example, the enzymes in cellular respiration. So what we have here is a housekeeping gene, beta-actin. Beta-actin is a very common housekeeping gene. All cells make it. And what we have here being shown right here is sequencing data showing how much of this messenger RNA for beta-actin is being expressed in different cell types. So you have embryonic stem cell, liver cell, muscle cell, blood vessel cell, blood cell precursor, skin cell, lung cell, right? And you can see in all of them, beta-actin is being expressed at the same level because this little bit here is the amplitude of expression, okay? And you can see the amplitude of expression is the same. Now you might be wondering why is it low here, like in these areas here and here and here, all the way across, it's because these are the introns. So when you do a read through, of course, on the messenger RNA, you're, the introns are not going to be there, right? Now we look at tyrosine aminotransferase gene. And tyrosine aminotransferase gene is a liver specific gene. And you can see that, again, the same cell lines as above, that this is only being expressed in liver cells and not being expressed anywhere else. Okay? So during the process of differentiation, that gene, the tyrosine aminotransferase gene, is silenced in all other cell types, but it's not silenced in liver cells, so it's available for expression. A specialized cell, individually, is capable of altering its gene expression in the confines of its differentiated status. And this part only means that, well, it can only alter gene expression of the genes that are available to it that have not been silenced. That's what the confines of its differentiated status means. A cell's phenotype and the way it responds to its environment is largely determined by the concentration levels of different proteins it expresses and their activity status. There are many steps during gene expression where the protein levels can be affected. So we have transcriptional control right here meaning that there are systems within the cell that will determine how many times RNA polymerase will bind to the promoter to make the RNA transcript. Then after the RNA transcript, that initial transcript is made, then you have RNA processing control. And that is under cellular control also, and you will get your messenger RNA. And then you have to move the messenger RNA in eukaryotic cells from the nucleus to the cytosol, and that's under a different set of controls by the cell, RNA transport and localization control. So sometimes messenger RNAs need to be localized to a certain part of the cell, to an organelle, for example, the rough ER, and that is under cellular control. Once a messenger RNA gets to the right place, it doesn't live forever. At some point, it will start to degrade, and the degradation of RNAs under cellular control there are enzymes that hydrolyze RNA molecules, and they don't do it at the same rate for all RNA molecules. Within the messenger RNAs, there are sequences that are not part of the coding region that will determine how fast an RNA molecule lives within the cell, giving it a certain half-life. Then there's translation control. How fast and how many times does a ribosome bind to a star codon and make the protein. Now once the protein is made, there's protein activity control, something that we will be talking about in this section. Proteins can be in the inactive state and be transferred to the active state through some cellular mechanism. So all these things are important because proteins decide the phenotype of a cell. Note the following. Within the available genes that a specialized cell can express, not all are being expressed. A large portion of genes are expressed only under correct circumstances, i.e. as part of a response to internal and external cues. Transcription regulatory proteins, TRPs, aka transcription factors, 
TRPs are DNA binding proteins. They specifically bind to a piece of double-stranded DNA. So not single-stranded, double-stranded. TRPs do not unwind the double-stranded DNA in order to bind to specific sequences. TRPs DNA binding domains will bind to the minor and major groove of DNA. In case you don't remember what the minor and the major groove are, here's a piece of double-stranded DNA, and you can see what the major and the minor groove are. There is binding information within each groove, which will be unique to the sequence of base pairs within the stretch of DNA. So all this picture is showing you, and all I'm trying to get across to you guys, is that within double-stranded DNA, in the major and the minor groove, there is sequence information. You don't have to unwind double-stranded DNA. So you can see that here we have, for example, G and C, and here we have A and T. And you can see that in the minor groove, right here, the information is different between the two. Same thing with the major groove. Basically, the information is in the form of hydrogen bonding acceptor and donating groups. Okay, And you can see here, with C and G and T and A, basically you're turning them around. Again, there is a difference between the sequence information and the major groove and the minor groove. And also, for example, between A and T and T and A. So if I go ahead and just get rid of all this stuff, and we can see that between T and A and A and T, that what you have is in the major groove, it is different, right? It's kind of flipped over, so the information is different. So the DNA binding domain of these TRPs, aka transcription factors, or any DNA binding protein that binds to double-stranded DNA, is going to recognize and bind to the major and the minor groove, specifically through these weak interactions that it can form with these hydrogen bonding acceptor and donating groups. And this is what's being shown here. The TRP's binding domain will not only have the correct form to interact with a stretch of double-stranded DNA, but also contain the correct sequence of amino acids at this domain so that it can form weak interactions with various hydrogen bonding acceptor and donating groups. So here we just have an example of a DNA binding domain of a protein, and it's just giving you information of what residues on that protein, what amino acids, are binding to this sequence of double-stranded DNA and where it's binding to. This is the major groove right here, and this is the minor groove right here, and the sequence basically, and I cannot tell if it's five prime to three prime in which end, but we'll, we'll just say A, start here, A, T, T, A, A, T, and of course the complementary strand will be T, A, A, T, T, A, right? And you can see, for example, all these numbers, arginine 31, arginine 53, arginine 31 means that the 31st amino acid in the protein, starting from the N terminus, is an arginine, so arginine 31. And the 53rd uh, amino acid is arginine 53. And arginine is a basic amino acid, and it's going to make an ionic bond with the sugar phosphate backbone of DNA. So that's what this is, the sugar phosphate backbone of DNA. But you can also see that, for example, isoleucine 47, arginine 3, arginine 5, these are making hydrogen bonding interactions with the minor groove, for example, here, and with the major groove, for example, with this, this, and this. These guys are making hydrogen bonding interactions with the major groove. And they're specifically recognizing certain combinations of nucleotides, base pairs, within that major groove and minor groove. A monomer of a typical TRP will recognize a run of six to eight nucleotides. This six to eight nucleotide sequence is sufficient to ensure that it will be unique. The sequence that TRPs bind to are also called cis regulatory elements. These are sometimes called enhancer regions in other textbooks. Cis regulatory elements are regulatory elements within a gene. The binding of a TRP to a cis regulatory element will lead to the activation of transcription or the suppression of transcription.
This is dependent on whether the TRP is an activator or a suppressor of transcription. So it is not necessarily true that all TRPs will be activators of transcription. Some TRPs will actually suppress transcription. The TRP will bind to a range of closely related sequences. If I have a protein that binds to double-stranded DNA, for example, let's say my double-stranded DNA that it recognizes is A, T, C, G, T, A, right? This is six nucleotides long. And of course, the, the complementary strand would be T, A, G, C, A, T, five prime. Now, I don't need to write both strands out if I'm talking about a TRP binding to a certain sequence. As long as I write out one sequence, one strand sequence, then I will know the other strand se sequence also. Now, that's just going to be a given, right? So what's being shown in this picture right here is the propensity of a TRP, what sequence it will recognize. Now, for example, in position one right here, it really prefers T over C, but it will bind also if there's C, but it will bind more weakly. That's why the letter T is larger. It must have an two A's as the next two in the sequence. And this is of course five prime to three prime, just in case. And then here, it really does prefer T, but it can also bind to a sequence that has two G's in the fourth and fifth position. And it prefers G over A, and it prefers C and G pretty equivalently. So if I was going to say the most optimal sequence for this hypothetical uh, TRP, it will be 5 prime T, A, A, T, T, G, C, 3 prime. And of course, the complementary sequence would be A, T, T, A, A, C, 5 prime, right? That will be the optimal sequence. It will have the highest Ka to bind to this sequence. Whereas the one with the least binding affinity for this hypothetical TRP, it would be 5 prime C. You cannot get rid of the A's. Those are required. And then G, G, A, G, 3 prime. And of course the complementary sequence. So the Ka for binding to this sequence will be the minimum. TRP activity. Most TRPs are in an inactive state in a cell. They are activated by signals the cell receives from its internal and external environment. Therefore, the activation of a TRP is a response by the cell to the changes in its environment. In differentiation, TRPs are activated, which leads to the expression of genes that maintain a specialized phenotype. The TRPs remain active for the duration of the cell's life, and if the cell goes through mitosis, the activation status is passed on to the daughter cells. This is an example of a persistent response of infinite length by cells. So we had this thing here where we're saying, okay, the cell receives some sort of signal, internal or external, or combination, that leads to a response, and that response can be gene expression. So let's go ahead and write this out with a little bit more information. So we have our signal, and this will lead to the activation of TRP. So we have TRPs in the inactive state, and we'll put that in red, and red would be inactive, and they are moved to the active state, and active would be green. And this will lead to specifically expressing genes that have the cis regulatory elements within them for this TRP. It is important to note, this is not going to be an overall increase in gene expression of all genes. The TRP will be specific to either enhance, activate the transcription of a specific set of genes that have that sequence within it. Now, of course, if the TRP is a suppressor of gene expression, then those genes that have that cis-regulatory element within them, transcription 
of those genes will be suppressed. Now, in the case of differentiation, what is happening is that the signal comes in and you get the TRPs activated that are important to maintain a differentiated status. And these TRPs go on to express genes that are important in maintaining the differentiated status of a cell. Now, when you go through cell division and you have these activated TRPs, and there's going to be some sort of positive feedback loop here to maintain this activated status. Well, the TRPs are going to be divided among the two daughter cells. So that activation status of the TRPs will be maintained because there's a positive feedback loop coming in from what is being expressed. This is very typical for dif the differentiated status. Okay? This positive feedback loop that leads to having these TRPs be active all the time. And it's important to note that some responses are persistent, meaning that they last the lifetime of the cell, and differentiation is one of them. Because once the cell differentiates, that differentiation status remains with the cell for the rest of the life of that cell, and it can be passed on to the daughter cells. Some TRPs will form dimers, prior to binding to their cis-regulatory sequence, or will bind DNA as monomers and then dimerize at the DNA. And this is actually very powerful because what it leads to is that, for example, we have two different TRPs here, the one in the green and one in the blue. So, for example, the green will, this will recognize a certain sequence. So when you have them together, well, that becomes two red. So that's a certain sequence, let's say red right here, that it recognizes. While the blue will recognize, let's say, the green sequence, which is different, so it will bind to sequences that are green-green, right? Now, when they form a dimer, the sequences that it will recognize are going to be different, right? Because it will be six to eight nucleotides of red and six to eight nucleotides of this green sequence, right? So the dimerization, meaning that you have the TRPs, the active TRPs actually forming dimers, and some of them are homodimers, where the two parts are the same, or the heterodimers, where the two parts are different, that could lead to different sequences being recognized. An activation of a whole set of different genes, and it could be that the homodimer, the genes that it activates or suppresses, are completely different than the heterodimer. And they could actually, the two responses could butt heads being opposite types of responses. About 10% of the protein coding genes of most organisms are devoted to TRPs. And that's basically it. And the reason why we're talking about this is because we're going to be talking about signal transduction. And we already started talking about signal transduction right here where we're talking about a signal coming into the cell, right? And something happening here, and that leads to TRP activation, and then that leads to gene expression, because the type of response by the cell is gene expression. It's not the only type, but it is a type. And I just wanted to make sure that we knew what TRPs and transcription factors are, so that when we start talking about these things, nobody is lost, okay? All right, guys, we'll end it here and continue with the rest of the section next. Thank you.